see this many people I, I was sincerely a little nervous because you know spring break nobody was coming to classes <laughs> and I thought oh I guess nobody's gonna uh, but I'm, I'm glad you're here because then we could show Antia what a great crowd you guys are um, thank you both on zoom and of course here live wow I didn't expect this many people here um, but thank you for sh for coming and showing up this is uh, really, really, it's going to be a fantastic lecture. Um, I've had the opportunity to spend time with Antia and chat about our, our different programs. And uh, it seems like we almost parallel with each other in, in many aspects. Um, so I, a, a little bit about her. She is from Germany and uh, she has a... Uh, a degree in interior design from the uh, University of Stuttgart. Did I say that right? <laughs> in Stuttgart. She says it much better than I do. It's, it's lovely. Anyway, um, and, and then she uh, went to the, the university in uh, Berlin where she discovered that she liked architecture better. And so uh, switched her, her degree and then uh, came to the U.S. and got her master's in architecture from UC Berkeley. Uh, she is co-founder of Ideal X Design, which is a, a collaborative uh, a, a firm where they deal with the urban fabric, which is pretty exciting as well, which, you know, as we go further up, some of you further up in your uh, design studios, you will definitely be dealing with the urban fabric. Uh, she's won several awards. I can't even list them all. I would be here for hours. Um, she is working for the enemy, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, she's working for California College of the Arts <laughs> and her degree is from UC Berkeley. <laughs> uh, she is the, the, the chair for the uh, architecture program over there. And uh, she's taught several of our, our students that have graduated from Texas Tech and have uh, got moved over to uh, the CCA to get their master's. So she's very familiar with our, with our program here. Uh, and I'm excited to hear what she has to say. So Antia, thank you very much. Antia Stanguel, everybody. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, for this. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes? Yeah, okay, perfect. Hopefully on Zoom as well. Thank you so much for this very kind introduction. Thank you all for being here. I cannot believe you're here. It's a Friday night. What are you doing? <laughs> you must like your instructor um, very much. Um, so um, you, you know approximately who I am. And I will also say that like, I'm not your sort of stereotypical traditional architect. So I do hope that some of what I have to say is relevant or interesting to you. And I'll try to make the bridge between um, what is built work, right? And how intentions um, between, say, research and, you know, strange things about design, strange sort of tools to be designed um, and uh, built work and how that sort of ties itself together. So um, I'm going to launch right in if it lets me. Okay, right. Okay. So um, as Emmanuel has uh, shared with you, um, I kind of split my time quite a bit, probably way more than I should, in the sense that uh, I'm chair of an architectural program at CCA, California College of the Arts. And in that context, I am also a co-director of a research lab called the Urban Works Agency, which sounds very fancy and it, it really is a group of faculty doing work together um, and enjoying each other's interests and research. And then, Oh, look, a familiar face. Hi. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Another CCA alum, right? <laughs> um, and um, the, the other part of me uh, has a small design firm called Ideal X Design um, with a colleague of mine who's also teaching at CCA. And um, I would say what these two sort of endeavors have in common is that 
I try to explore like how the knowledge uh, of architects or designers carries into all different ways of acting on the world, some of which is building buildings, but a lot of it is not. So keep that in mind as you're, oh, as you're hearing um, from me tonight. Um, so a quick thing about the Urban Works Agency. The Urban Works Agency works mainly through research, exhibitions, publications, um, and so on. Um, and uh, we've partnered a lot with local institutions, organizations, nonprofits, other universities, et cetera. So it's a kind of link between CCA as a school and a program and you know, faculty research and the city. Um, research trajectories that exist in the Urban Works Agency all deal with some kind of collectivity or collective interest, perhaps. Um, on the far right, left, sorry, left for you, on the far left, um, you see sort of our research on climate issues um, called uh, known unknowns. So we're looking at seawater level rise. Those of you knowing San Francisco know why that matters to us. We're surrounded by, um, by water on three sides. Um, infrastructure is a big topic, infrastructure in the sense of high-speed rail in California and what that will do to the Central Valley, for example. And then the last um, sort of category here is what we call domestic affairs. This is our way of saying like housing and the housing crisis really matters. You know, in this day and age, it affects a lot of people outside of California as well. And um, this is also what I'll talk about more since that is sort of where my own research is uh, situated. So Ideal X, on the other hand, um, well, it also does research and publications. But we also work with private clients. Um, we work, for example, with uh, the company that does the food truck based events around San Francisco. So like markets, you know, big parties, et cetera, all situated around food trucks. Um, and our work, I would say in general, is really interested in engaging others, like groups of people, the public citizens in dialogue, right? So how do you sort of get people to talk about what they want and they need? Um, ways of catalyzing um, activation of public space. How do you get people to actually be somewhere and do something that's an abandoned space? And then um, ways in general of engaging non-expert or audiences in uh, conversations about design. So now it's working. Excellent. So I'll start this um, excursion into the design of connectivity with some work that Ideal X is doing. Then I'll talk about that research I mentioned on the domestic affairs, which is really sort of research and policy type work. And I'll close with some build work that takes the idea of collectivity and applies it, if you will, in a very, very small scale. So follow, follow me in. <laughs> um, so my practice Ideal X is named after the first container ship. The first container ship as a vehicle for transporting temporary enclosures and content. We situate ourselves sort of in the, in the lineage of work that became known, for example, with Archigram's British firm, I hope you're familiar, um, Archigram's Instant City, where a blimp arrives over a town and deploys temporary media and tools to connect people to one another. When it leaves, the events that took place in its presence leave behind a changed and more connected landscape. And that is something that we still think is really relevant you know, for us to do. This way of working also links to my history in Berlin. You know, As Emmanuel mentioned, um, I uh, moved to Berlin not too far after the wall came down and the whole city opened up. There was so much unused space and really like no legislation, nothing in place to actually do something. So everybody did something, right? People did, artists did, architects did, and they all made use of space. And then as a result of seeing how well that worked, the city government adjusted legislation. And that's sort of the kind of process that I'm very interested in. So I took away from this that uh, engaging citizens more actively in the production of urban space produces a sense of ownership, a sense of community, um, and something that is really sort of truly amazing and changes the relationship we not only have to one another, but really also have to our cities and the places we live. So that's kind of, you know, to articulate a little bit my own values. Um, I also learned through this that engaging citizens in the design of anything, urban space, you know, private space, etc., means that the engagement itself needs to be designed. Right? So we as architects, um, even if we're not sort of designing like, 
you know, the public space itself, we need to design the event right, within which um, gatherings, um, engagement, exchange, etc., can take place and the processes, right, in which that takes place. So if you think about how that happens, you know, in conventional sort of city um, governments, um, city sort of environments, um, it takes place through community meetings in which the community is shown a pretty picture um, of like what the place is going to be and they get to say yes or no. And the whole thing sort of stands in, you know, more for, uh, you know, like a, a sort of mandate, right, to involve citizens rather than meaningful participation in decision making. So in recent years, there's been more of a recognition that we need to do this differently, right? Participation has to happen much more actively, much more inclusively. We need to see like who's at the table and so on. And so um, the trajectory of the work of IDLX has been looking at drawings really as a collective act. So not just one person drawing with expertise, but rather really bringing people together around a drawing and having them draw together as a way of gathering the expertise that citizens hold in any context. So the work we did began with a gallery installation, which is what you see here. It's in the Milwaukee Art Museum, or was at the time. And it uh, was a suitcase, so it could be transported to different contexts. And inside of it um, was, I hope this projects reasonably well, um, inside of it are two um, scrolls of drawings of Milwaukee, Milwaukee Art Museum, and a prompt in the lid, you know, that invited citizens to share with us things that should happen in those places, things that, you know, should be known about those places, etc. So, um, with that, you know, we realized the base drawings that we drew on the left side here are really critical, right? Like how you design those, whether they're legible to lay people, you know, how, how they invite um, interaction is really, really important. We used axonometric drawings as a way of showing three-dimensionally what the places were that helped a bit. Um, but one issue we recognized quickly is that the duration and sort of a moderation of such a process is really important and probably also needs to be led by architects. Because if you don't do that, what is on the right happens, right? Which is your proverbial toilet stall wall, right? So this was up for four weeks or five weeks and everyone was like scribbling all over it. And in the end, we could barely read anything, right? That people had suggested. So since then, you know, I'm not showing more of this, but the suitcase has traveled to three more locations, always getting um, new drawings, right, for Denver, for Las Vegas, et cetera. Um, and we always got back, you know, some version of um, this very sort of littered, um, interactive, loved drawing, et cetera. So one of our lessons was to say, like, um, let's do this differently. Let's actually design the event. And let's also give other kinds of prompts that are perhaps a bit more interactive. So what we tested here was we designed a table in addition to the drawing. So it's a, it's a portable table, so it can go to different places. And we offered um, giant, I don't know if any one of you have ever played Yardsy, I think is that sort of game, right, that you can play in the yard. So those kinds of um, dice, right, that are really big. And we uh, put on them um, uh, kind of known precedents um, of uh, community interventions, you know, small scale interventions in public space as a prompt to say like something like this could happen, right? And what if, right? So you roll the dice, you get sort of a picture and you get to sort of think about this. I should also say this event was totally different in the sense that um, it was with not a layperson audience, it was with uh, professors in a campus setting. And the particular um, question we pondered was, how could we design campus events much better where knowledge exchange is really much more prominent? I don't know how it is on your campus. I haven't seen enough yet besides your beautiful building. Um, but a lot of campuses in the US are designed as like silos of knowledge, right? Here's the architecture building, over there is the engineering building, et cetera. And you have to, if it was San Francisco, et cetera, you'd have to walk through the rain and the fog, you know, to go somewhere else to find the expertise. So how can we not do that, right? What are the spaces of exchange? And so um, that is in essence kind of what um, was on the table, um, as you sort of see in that excerpt here, 
and then let's see if I can make this happen. I can make this happen. So here's a sort of time lapse um, of looking at a group of people basically rolling the dice and then starting to talk to one another about, um, you know, sort of where other spaces of knowledge and knowledge exchange could happen. So this was limited in time. It was only like at an hour, an hour at a time. The physical setting of the table was really important. The dice were fun and critical and they really produced a kind of collective gathering of knowledge. And while we've had not had the chance to um, implement this within a community project like out in the world, we feel that this is a really good sort of paradigm right, to say like, as an architect, we can design right, the setting within which people meet, the, the kind of platform and prompts and protocols right, within which they interact. And that is then um, one of the tools right, to catalyze interaction and have a collective conversation, right, a truly collective, inclusive conversation. So this is sort of about designing tools and protocols around collectivity. And I'm going to jump right from here to saying like, um, what about designing collectivity in housing? So this um, goes into urban works agency related work um, under the umbrella of domestic affairs, as we called it, because we think of it as quite political. Um, and uh, this is work that I'm doing with my colleague Niraj Bhatia, who's also faculty at uh, CCA. Um, you can also see like all the work is collaborative. I think that also really speaks to the nature of architecture, right? We do things together because it's difficult. Um, so um, when we look at how we live together in urban housing today, um, we, we have to note right, that financial pressures and rapid population growth really add a lot of sort of challenges to cities. Um, um, in San Francisco proper, this is really also a matter of like what the city looks like. So what you see here is that view of San Francisco. You see how much of it is zoned a single family residential. Um, San Francisco is surrounded by water on three sides, so it can't grow. Um, because everyone in San Francisco has the view from the hill and knows exactly what San Francisco is supposed to look like, you cannot tear anything down. And you have to leave it all in place. Like it's politically really unacceptable to say, like, let's just empty this block and like build more high density housing. So it's a real hot potato. And at the same time, we're totally out of affordable housing. And um, the housing that we have built, right, is for the nuclear family at the same time about 30% of inhabitants. Think about this. 30% um, is uh, living, is actually living as a nuclear family. So how the housing is and how people actually live totally do not match up, right? Um, so people live very differently. So all of the pressures I just mentioned have led to this. You know, these are statistics from 2019 or 2018, 2019 from pre-pandemic. It's actually still the same though. Um, so uh, one bedroom apartment is about $3,700. I don't know what it is here, but it's a lot for San Francisco and its income. So, um, and there's, it, it's really complex um, what the kind of reasons are behind it. And they're not reasons, right, that architects can fix by designing one building of affordable housing. And that's, I think, why I talk about it more in light of research. And um, my presentation sort of argues, as architects, you can do research that impacts policy. So what is being built in San Francisco at the same time, just as a quick excursion, is this, which are um, micro units. They're tiny, they're 270 square feet. Everything is stuffed into it. You can fry an egg from the edge of your bed, right? It's like super, super compact. And just imagine like um, wanting to move in with your partner or having a baby or anything doesn't work, right? You cannot make it happen. So you always need to move. It's the most unflexible uh, type of housing right, that you could possibly imagine. Um, and so, um, and at the same time, it's not actually much cheaper, right, than a one bedroom or any sort of more reasonable form of housing. So this is really what we were sort of reacting against and thinking like something else has to happen. We have to rethink this. In San Francisco proper, um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty clear, right, that this is not totally new. Um, as the city was developing and growing rapidly in the 1800s during the gold rush, 
Um, a lot of migrants were moving to San Francisco, women moving alone, people moving without their families. And as a result, the single room occupancy hotel or SRO developed and you see its broad plan, it's cramming a lot of people in. Not um, super collective, but it is a little bit because on the ground level, there used to be, you know, gathering spaces, restaurants, shops, etc. So a way of forming community between people, say, who came from the same place, right? So there, there are sort of roots in this somewhere. Um, Niraj and I reacted against um, the um, uh, sort of the uh, phenomenon of Sorry, I should say this differently. We reacted for um, the phenomenon of um, having a lot more collective housing typologies emerge in the last decade. So we looked around and we could see everywhere, you know, like articles popping up, like intentional communities, this, co-living, that, etc. We became really interested because the way the media represented this um, was actually um, very much uh, like this is only like financial, financially motivated, right? If people had a choice, they'd move immediately somewhere else. And we figured that this was actually quite different um, in reality. And we, we were really sort of starting to look at um, this more comprehensively, um, deciding to analyze a lot of the collective living um, phenomena that we could see, connecting with those communities, and then seeing basically like, what we as architects could learn from these communities that come up from the bottom up, undesigned, um, but they're working, right? They're doing something right. So what can we kind of learn from that? We're also sort of thinking that um, we really, this is one way of thinking much more fundamentally outside the box, not designing just affordable housing project, not propagating single family housing, but using our skills as architects who design social relationship automatically, no matter whether we want to or not. And to say that we need a fundamentally different housing type. We need to design for the way people really want to live, namely probably more collectively, right? Um, before I get into the details of our research, a quick reminder right, that living alone as a nuclear family or alone is a new phenomenon, right? This is, if we look back further in time than say the 1950s, living together was always the norm, right? It was not the exception. And um, the splitting of people into nuclear families um, can really only be described as a political act. This happened after World War II, when workers' unrest happened in cities, the big sort of companies approached the government and basically said like, we're really afraid, you know, that we're going to lose workers, we're going to have to sort of change our conditions. Um, and the government sort of responded by propagating single family homes, creating the suburbs, suburbs as we know them today, as a way of weakening the relationship that the workers had to the city, moving them out of the city, and focusing them on paying off loans for single family houses. Right? Think about it, like suddenly you have a family and you owe money for your house, that you've gotten sort of a government loan a little bit for, but you have to pay it back. So you're not going to go ahead and like, you know, demonstrate against your employer, right? You are going to make sure you stay in the suburbs or a family person and pay off your resident, right? So in a way, um, and I, I should also mention, um, there is a deeply racist uh, policy in this as well. I'm not sure how popular or unpopular I am saying this here in this context, um, but um, these single family residence loans um, were tied to uh, government uh, policies that made them inaccessible to people of color. So entirely white neighborhoods were, um, were basically emerging, right, and no color, uh, person of color could, could come in or could sort of live in the same neighborhoods, could have access to the same funding. So, um, Again, for me, one more way of saying like housing and how we design it is incredibly political. So that also means as we revise how we as architects think about housing and propagate a different typology of housing, it's equally political, but in the other direction. Right? It has a high political potential. So again, the history of this is really old. Here's some typologies in China of um, collective housing for entire expanded families where each 
uh, family actually had a four-story slice of the pie, and uh, the communal space inside the donut um, was really sort of open for everyone to share. And as you went from your bedroom on the top to your living room on the second floor, you automatically started engaging with the rest of the community. The pretty innovative things, right, that were there in, um, in history. And then, of course, many of you might be familiar with the more designed um, examples of collective living. Um, this is the Narkom Finn building um, from uh, sort of the modern period, the 1920s in Russia. And um, this was later uh, the precedent for Le Corbusier's Unité d'Habitation, if you know that one. Um, and this, again, is like housing provided by the Communist Party, also totally political, um, in the sense that um, so here, everyone, every, all the families were given housing for a particular, the families who worked in the same workplace were given housing here. And um, um, cooking and childcare services were provided in a separate building, which is the one you see in the photo. Um, and this meant that domestic labor, right, was really reduced. The women could all sort of participate in the workforce. Um, and what this did as a result was it weakened the nuclear family ties in favor of ties to the factory and therefore this, the party and therefore the state, right? Again, highly political and uh, intended to reform the society, which is sort of where that term, uh, what that term social condenser uh, signifies that is usually applied to this building. So here's sort of where you see all the units and circulation um, was sort of the connector, right, between people, but a circulation space is never a moment where people gather as a group, right, to demonstrate or to think about their political affinities, so just in passing, very, very transient. And then one last sort of um, extreme example, the kibbutzim in Israel that were set, um, were settlements uh, originally founded by the Jewish population returning to Israel and formed around um, agricultural uh, endeavors, et cetera, and shared values. And in those, you know, you can sort of guess at that in the plan, um, partners were living together, but their children were actually living separately. So the children were raised entirely collectively, right, in a separate building, um, co-parented, you know, by women taking turns um, to take care of them, right? So very, very different conceptions that have nothing to do with the nuclear family. All this to say, all of this is not new, right? So with this brief excursion into historical models, I'll return to California and specifically San Francisco. In California history, right, there's been periods of great precarity, right? People kind of coming there, you know, just going by their shoestrings, um, but also idealism, the myth of the American West, um, the summer of love in the 60s, sort of ideas, uh, moments where sort of ideas of doing everything differently um, were really sort of rising to the top. And um, today, um, and this is what you see here, the number of communal households um, are approaching exactly what we had in the 1960s, right? When the communes and summer of love and all of that was associated so much with California and San Francisco, we're, we're there again, right? <laughs> Which is so interesting to me, like in the middle of the capitalist kind of wave of the tech industry that we have and so on. So we began our research with documenting the full range of what we could find. There are many, many different models of how collectivity manifests itself in um, in these kinds of uh, living models. There might be collective ownership, you know, to, but uh, separate units, for example, in co-housing. There might be collective management models in co-ops. There might be collective living initiated by developers, you know, where strangers share a household. Or, um, and this is probably where we've biased our research a bit, um, intentional communities that want to live together as a group of 20 or 30, based on shared values and lifestyles and pre-existing friendships and so on. So in the 60s, right, um, the so-called summer of love basically got um, a lot of people to reimagine households. The conventional households were things that represented convention, government, institution, et cetera, all the things that people were kind of protesting against and looking for alternatives for. And um, one of the things that happened at the time was that people moved to the hinterland. So up to like five hours outside of San Francisco, rural farms became sort of the sites of 
what was called the back to the land communes that experimented with other notions of family in compound structures, typically with one shared common building and ideas about shared childcare, sharing everything, including clothing, right? Having sort of a shared closet, everyone like a hundred people dressing from one closet. But it should also be said that they were very isolated from one another you know, by virtue of being outside of the cities. Inside cities, um, as one example, the Cauliflower Commune um, was one of the few communes that ended up trying to create a dialogue between communes, sharing knowledge and resources between single domestic or between individual domestic spaces. Um, one way in which they did this was through a shared print shop. So they were able to print leaflets, et cetera, exchanging knowledge and so on um, between different um, communes. The other super interesting was the free food conspiracy. So they collected food stamps and other means of, you know, sort of supporting oneself, collected them between all kinds of communes, bought food in bulk and distributed, based, distributed it based on needs. It's an example in a way of scaling up a domestic sharing, right? Like how people shared within domestic units of 20, but sort of saying like, let's do that in the neighborhood, right? Let's do that in Haight-Ashbury, et cetera. And in a way, this is kind of worth looking at again today. Um, and it's one of the things that um, Niraj and I are also sort of looking at, right? Does this happen today? How does it happen? And what do architects really have to say about it? I would say as a last thing about this slide, collectivity here emerges through a network, right? And it's a network of care in the form of, you know, shared food and shared knowledge. And one other example for this uh, from the same time was the way the Black Panther Party um, developed uh, institutions of care for African Americans in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Um, and, you know, they saw like nutrition for the community as really the basis for political um, uh, education and political sort of activity. And so they created in one of the normal residential buildings, the um, breakfast program for children before school. And that expanded to feed like, I think, 20,000 children in the end, right, and in different locations. It was pretty incredible, right, what could happen when um, the, this idea of collectivity and taking care of one another and sharing resources um, goes beyond sort of a single household. So back to San Francisco, right, and um, San Francisco, the Bay Area, is today, as many of you might know, the center of the tech industry, Apple, Facebook, Google, et cetera, they're all like right at our doorstep. And it's one of the richest regions globally, eight out of 10 richest, the eight out of the 10 richest city in the US are in the Bay Area. So very depressing in some way. Um, at the same time, we struggle with a large unhoused population. You know, here you have the tech, tech worker walking through um, a homeless encampment. And the housing crisis um, is uh, an issue of both the quantity of available units, but also the cost, of course. Perhaps we could say that San Francisco today is emblematic of all the inequities of capitalism. Um, so this commodification of the housing um, market is driven by market speculation um, and has many seeking these alternatives that I've talked about before. Um, so in order to learn from all of this, finally getting to the point here, um, uh, we uh, decided on a methodology that we refer to as hardware, software, and orgware. So there's again a thesis in here to say, um, we as architects, even though we're designing mostly hardware, right, like the physical form of things, we also really need to look at software, which is how space is used, right, like who's in the space, how is space used, how does the use change, and so on, what kind of time scales of use exist. And then orgware is sort of organization where, as the word or um, sort of suggests, like how does use of the spaces actually work, right? Like what makes it work? What rules do we need? What, how is labor distributed, right? All of these things, I argue, we also need to understand a little bit. So I'll, I'll talk through um, the, the ways in which we sort of understand this and how we've mapped it. So hardware, of course, refers to the physical framework of co-living spaces, including the interfaces between collective and private realms. Um, we documented this, all of the case studies that we've looked at today, 
through exploded axonometrics, as you see them here. And we color coded the walls in blue um, if they were for shared space, collective space, and uh, for private spaces in gray. Here sort of gives you an example of how much we've done. You know, we're, I think, approaching 40 case studies. This has been a five year project. Um, and again, very, very different forms, right, of um, what these communities take. Um, some of them in existing buildings, some of them newly built, um, very, very different typologies um, that we categorized. And um, it's interesting sort of what the uh, building types are, right, that now house 20 to 30 unrelated people. So San Francisco has a lot of single family mansions you know, that happened for, you know, were built for um, fairly wealthy people throughout its history. And they're character characterized often through um, like interconnected social spaces, lots of, you know, um, uh, you know, beautifully ornamented living spaces with bay windows and, you know, all, all of that. And then of course, a lot of bedrooms, which lend themselves needless to say also for communal living. Um, here, for example, is a house where the um, top level that you see here used to be just one single master bedroom. Now it's housing bunk bed um, for 14 people. And the bed in that space, the master bed, could be lowered into the ground in order to um, make it a ballroom. So that gives you a sense of the scale of it. These are such sort of outrageous um, kind of typologies. And, Today, again, like a lot of different people are um, living in here. Um, in Europe, we also looked at select examples in Europe just because there are good ones. Um, so in Europe, um, new cooperatively developed projects come up with really interesting unit types. What you see here, for example, is um, so-called cluster units. You have small units that are complete in themselves. They have living spaces, they have kitchens, etc. But then all the spaces between, right, where the blue walls are, have larger kitchens and larger living spaces and the big dining table, etc. So giving people alternatives as to whether they want to stay private or um, be with you know, the 12 to 14 people who are in the same larger units. So for design, there are a few very, very obvious things. Um, the ability to gather an entire community is key to most communes. Right? These large spaces are most useful when they can take on different roles. This is a community in a form of paint factory um, that has a large double height industrial loading dock that is now used for everything from parties, sleeping, building, and storage. This is a big Burning Man festival community, so they do their work sort of in there, um, as the drawing on the left is sort of indicating. Um, being able to sort of flexibly divide and connect spaces, um, as you see in the photo here in the embassy commune, is also, of course, like very conducive to having people do several things at once, you know, in different partition spaces. And then we also realized that um, private space is not necessarily a bedroom, right? So people might choose to sleep in a bed with six other people in a room, like three, three four bunk beds. Um, but, uh, you know, people might argue you're unconscious when you sleep. So why would that be the private space? So what we found is that private space takes on all sorts of other forms, right? Whether it's a work desk in a greenhouse, it's an outdoor shower behind the building, it's like a, a little alcove, you know, where you can sort of sit with your laptop and look out at the community. It can take on very, very different yet highly articulated forms. Um, and then in the communal space is really what kind of flows in between. So hardware. Software um, and encompasses social units, right? It allows us to understand better how sharing works um, within the way people use space. Um, and um, our software analysis was also looking at how people appropriate space, right? Like, how do you sort of say, like, this is my territory for now, if it's a shared space? We've also done this in uh, exploded axonometric, but in this case, we've sort of really exploded it, right, to the different rooms. And um, what you see at the top is, you know, we begin with sort of the private space, whether it's the bed in the bank bed, or it's a room um, per se. And then we look at, you know, are there sort of tiers in which people share something? For example, like three, four people might share a bathroom, right? Those four people 
you get to know more intimately, right? You know how cleanly they are, you see their toothbrush, you know, you see what they leave behind, you know, all of that. That produces a kind of better knowing and a, a sense of intimacy that you might not have with the rest of the people in the community. So along the bottom, right, you see all the spaces. This is again the space called embassy, um, that the whole community has access to. And I would note about that, one of the big reasons for people to live together is, for example, this you share with 20 people, but you have access to a greenhouse, an outdoor shower, a bowling alley, a co-working space, a kayak, you know, et cetera, et cetera, all things that would not be part of your one bedroom. But you could never afford that just for yourself, but you have access to it, a sauna, I forgot, but like lots of things like that um, you wouldn't normally have access to. So we also looked at this way of appropriating space. So here's the situation with bunk beds, people put curtains, you know, bring plants, etc., as a way of sort of saying that this is my territory. You might be able to see in the projection that it's two line colors, like the blue is sort of what people bring to the space. The black is what was there before. And then, of course, there is sort of the big kind of outline of like, here's the many things we've looked at. And what we've discovered is that if developers design collective living um, in sort of co-living startups, um, you basically have like a unit and then some things that are shared. And the circulation is often in a place where you don't ever have to engage with community. You can just like take the stair, go to your room. And it's really not that communal at all. Whereas, you know, coming back to the embassy, because it's just such a good example, there's often an intermediate tier, right, where a few people share um, a kind of small sitting area or a bathroom or, you know, whatever it is, right? And those are sort of smaller circles of people that get to know one another better. And then, of course, there's lots of stuff to share for everyone. And we also discovered in European examples um, that this can extend beyond the building. This is the um, Sack Public in Vienna, translates into Coffin Factory, because that's exactly what it was before. <laughs> but um, this basically has a set of autonomous units at the top, and then each of the buildings, it's several buildings, it's a whole complex, has a roof garden and a library, and there's a couple of other things. And then um, shared by all is um, a bounce house, uh, daycare, um, community space, cafe, and so on, and they also all serve the neighborhood. So you can, as, a, as someone who lives in the neighborhood, you pay like, I don't know, five euros a month, you know, not much, and you have full access to all of that. So it can extend, right, beyond individual households. So we also became really technical, right, and we measured, right, and we looked at um, you know, how big is everything? How, how much private space? How much semi-private space? How much um, public space? What kind of shared space? Who is living there? For how long? What is their age group? And so on, as a way of sort of really trying to dig into this from an architectural um, perspective. And I'll come back to why that's necessary. Someone's applauding already. <laughs> Does that mean I'm, I'm going too long? I'm going to finish in an hour, I'm sure. So, um, and let me get into orgware real quick. So we found that we need to understand like why this even works. Like why do people share space and it actually is sort of possible? What makes it work? And anyone who's ever lived with anybody else knows that this is not easy. Um, as you can see on the right, the internal rules that govern daily life are constantly produced and reproduced and need to be posted, etc. as individuals negotiate the collective. You know, many of us feel very strongly about our toilet paper, um, you know, labels are necessary and so on. So there's many sort of funny things when you look at these communities and you sort of see how they how kind of rules become visual and present. You know, you see like entire manifestos sort of about the kitchen sink, you know, about how to do or not do the dishes, you know, et cetera. So we found all this really fascinating, but more than anything, we were wondering like, if there are 20 plus people, how on earth do you keep it clean, right? Who, who is sort of on top of this, right? Do you argue about this all the time? So we did this sort of somewhat esoteric diagram of looking at the tick marks around the edges are every single hour of domestic labor required for this particular community, the Bet Victorian. In the concentric circles, you can read um, how often any task needs to be performed, daily, weekly, monthly, 
quarterly, et cetera. And um, there is a hatch pattern also sort of underlaid. I'm not sure how good the projection is, I can't tell. But um, each hatch pattern presents um, one person who stewards a certain area of domestic labor, like everything around food, everything around organizing events, you know, everything around transient members. Sometimes these unit, these communities rent one room to guests or something like that. And so the steward, you know, who's in the legend, then directs tasks to a lot of other people. And then there's a dot system, you know, behind that or in front of the names, which talks about the degree of difficulty of the task, right? Doing the accounting is more difficult than rinsing a coffee cup. So how do you account for that? It blew our minds, right? Like what or where is behind this? And um, to try to think like, how does this perhaps impact how we organize space as architects? So here's a couple more. This is the benevolent dictatorship where one person really is on the lease and that person has a say in everything. So it's only one gray hatch um, for how labor is organized. All decisions have to go through that person. And then the co-living, um, the, the sort of developer initiated things we call an assistocracy because every single thing goes through a community manager, including like interpersonal relationships. So you have to do nothing when you live there. Um, and we found in the end that these were the kinds of communities where people move out so quickly, right? It somehow, it, it got us to the conclusion that unless you engage in some debate about labor and how to clean, et cetera, you're not really engaging with community and the, the community's longevity is not so much there, right? So labor as a condition, right, of actually creating community. So why, why did we go through all this trouble, right? So it allowed us to compare, you know, for example, here, I believe this is a comparison of private to communal space, right? We did all these kinds of comparisons, like on the list down on the left, you see all the communities that we had analyzed at that particular point. And we did this because we wanted to have impact. So we approached the planning department and said, you guys should be interested in this, right? There's so many developers who are exploiting um, the so-called group housing legislation, which is the, the way the codes, the planning codes sort of labels um, collective living. And so there, there's a loophole where basically you can build more densely, you can squeeze more units into new buildings if you say that it's that. But at the same time, it's not communal at all. It's not really about the group. It's just about micro units. We could see this happening, right? This is one version where I think the blue is the collective space and what we're showing here is underground. So it's like one or two collective spaces and it's in the basement. So imagine how beautiful those spaces are. There's another project that I'm not showing that had one kitchen for 500 people. You know, it's just like, it blows your mind, right? It's um, it's not functional. It's really just for show and just to say that you can build more density. So we approached the planning department and said, like, you guys should really look at this. And surprisingly, they agreed to meet with us. They gave us money to do some more case studies. And as a result, we were able to produce a 300 page white paper that had all of our research in there. Here you see sort of everything that was kind of analyzed by us. And we got to present this to the planning commission. From there, it went to the land use committee, to the board of supervisors, and was signed into law in San Francisco um, last year and in May. And it's changed how group housing works in San Francisco. So think about this as like something that could empower you too. Like architects doing research doesn't mean that we're sort of hiding behind our desks in our ivory towers, you know, in the universities, but it's really actually, it has relevance, it has impact. And city institutions don't normally think about doing this, right? So there are ways in which architectural skills through research can lead to policy change. So um, let's see. Landware, tiny excursion at the end. I mentioned before that we were interested to see like, can this move beyond a household? Like, can we sort of look at um, a community that's bigger than, than um, this? So we looked again to Europe and saw that some of the newly built 
communities there have a kind of larger scale of collectivity that was designed into them. So this is an entirely new designed but cooperatively designed um, neighborhood in Zurich um, called Mehr als Wohnen, More Than Living. And um, again, it was with residents collectively designed and financed. And you can see that it literally has all this blue outdoor space and every building on the ground floor has some common facility. So a um, really great model of what could be, but of course we don't have the luxury of just rebuilding neighborhoods. So today, like what we see in San Francisco, again, is totally not new built because we can't, um, but uh, we see that now a lot of the communities are in touch with one another, kind of like in the 60s, right, when they had that communal newspaper. So what we've seen um, early on was that communities that were very close to one another, the blue ones here, there's three blue ones in there, um, they were sharing like a van, a kayak, some tools, um, sort of spaces that weren't used often. Like think about how, how often we use some things that are in our households, right? It's totally inefficient. So they were trying to do this um, at, at a neighborhood level. And out of that developed what is called the Hate Street Commons, which now I think has 70 communities uh, in it. Um, so a really large uh, group of people are coming together and they are now working on what they call garage cities. So looking at statistically, like how are our garages used? And in San Francisco, people use them for storage, if anything, right? They're not really used for parking or at least not during the day, they're empty you know, for periods of the day. And so um, people were basically saying that this is more or less free space that we can give back to the sidewalk. So what if right, we just sort of offer our garage back, right? There's the lemonade stand, you know, the space for kids to play when it's raining, et cetera, et cetera, right? Or the neighborhood barbecues and like eats on the sidewalk um, and so on. And they're now using a program that the city has called the Cultural Districts Program to um, develop what they call a commons district. So a neighborhood would be labeled like commons district, like the communities that are a, a district that's known for its uh, communal living. And then they have easier access to funding, to support, um, and perhaps over time to different legislation. So pretty fascinating. So we had we were fortunate to also share um, the, this work that we've been doing for more than five years. It's going to be a book. It hasn't become the book quite yet. We're still writing it. But we exhibited at various sort of biennales. We've had a chance at uh, exhibiting it in a museum as part of what we called a seat at the table. Um, where we sort of designed a couple of tables, you know, that were um, sort of holding that material. And um, most recently, where we're at the Venice Biennale, where we used laundry racks from IKEA as a sort of quintessential domestic element, as a sort of carrier, right, for these different trays of information about communal living. And we showed, similar to what I showed to you, right, sort of on screens and so on, um, some of the background information, and then we 3D printed some of the private and some of the communal spaces um, that we had identified. So that's that chapter. And just super quickly, I'll bring this back to like, what about architecture? Right? I talked about collectivity a lot. At the same time, I have to admit, you know, I wish I was designing like big housing projects for communal living. Not there yet. I'm currently working with one client who's interested in that. But, you know, it takes a while to change the mind of the people with money. So I'm still working on that. Um, but <laughs> um, I, I have designed and built uh, um, some uh, um, single family and small, smaller spaces. And I'll just show you two that I designed um, when I was a principal at Studio Urbis, architecture design and urbanism firm in Berkeley, California. I was with them for, I think, 18 years. I'm so old. Um, <laughs> but um, they did really beautiful work. But in retrospect, I look back at this work and think like, oh, all my interest in connectivity was really already there, right? It's not that I needed sort of that research into collective housing. So I'll show you just a couple of projects um, at the end. This one is called um, The Elements House. Um, it's a ground up new uh, residence in Palo Alto, um, you know, right in Silicon Valley. Um, 
it is in a very suburban neighborhood and you see on the left sort of what that sequence of houses kind of looks like it's what you would expect it's you know very contained houses with their front lawn and their back lawn um how we approached it was to say like let's not sort of cloister private space quite so much let's actually look at the site like the entire thing as the kind of territory that is you know accessible both to people inside but perhaps also with connection to people living next door or passing by on the street so um the whole sort of space right of the house like no matter whether it's inside or outside got designed and programmed as as one sort of surface and then we used a number of sort of architectural elements to make that happen right this transition between inside and outside um there were concrete walls that were both landscape elements, as you see in the bottom left, but were also sort of the elements that became the major sort of walls of the house. Um, steel structures were allowing us to sort of cantilever big horizontal planes out. Um, and the sort of materiality of using wood and then having wood materials in the site, in the fencing, et cetera, also kind of created a bigger landscape. In terms of how the inside was organized, right, you see very few partitions, right? All of this is kind of designed as a set of interconnected territories that have flexible boundaries or overlaps with one another. So there's quite a few sliding doors um, on the upper level where the bedrooms are. And then there's also sort of a very open relationship to the outside. So here's what that looks like, right, from the inside. So you see basically from the dining area directly out onto a patio. Um, from there, you see over into the living area where the blue color is on the left, is sort of a two-story living area. There's a water feature outside. Um, and um, the steel structure is sort of visible and pulls you through the space um, as a whole. You sort of see right, that absence of like a lot of partitions um, in the plans as well. And here's the fun part. <laughs> the client asked, um, this is also what gave the house, the house its name. The client asked like for water, right? They were really into water and sort of saying like, oh, we really want water to be part of the house. So we built the house like a boat and um, basically it's half house, half boat. And half of it is filled with water and the pool. And the other half is filled with house. And then from the outside, right, you just see the the house sitting um, at the edge of the pool. But from the inside, you have the pool kind of in the in the living area, right? And here's a couple more images. Like there's a media viewing area in the lower level, but you get that sort of dappling filtered light from the water, um, really into the house. And then, as I mentioned, there's a few other couple of other water features that give you the sound of water and so on. And so. Um, so the, in a way, the material of concrete, wood, and water is sort of what holds that house together. And then other than that, you use sort of color a bit. Um, and you know, if you look sort of closely in the background there, you see a couple of green walls, and you see them in association with the green space outside. So it's another way for us to kind of blur the boundaries between inside and outside, between site and, um, and resident. So, that's that. And the, the red is sort of like the kitchen as the hearth, right? The fire, the heat, and so on. And this is a family that cooks very spicy food. You know? So that's perhaps also kind of um, in, in that. So the color characterizes some of my work, even though I only wear black. But I like color, <laughs> just for the record. So the other house, the final project I'll, sh I'll share with you tonight, is a project that I worked on while I was at Studio Urbis. And I'm working on it again, you know, the clients came back to me now that I am with Ideal X. So I just had a client meeting in that house on one of those white chairs two days ago. Um, so it's fun to sort of go back to projects um, that um, I worked on in the past. This one is not ground up, you know, so you see here that's pretty conventional or at least very typical floor plan for the kind of ranch style houses that you see in uh, Silicon Valley a lot, the one story houses. Um, and this was really in the beginning, just a redesign, right? Like changing a little bit of the living areas, um, but also redesigning the landscape. And this offered for us, again, a, a sense of like, let's break the boundaries of the house. Like, right? let's sort of see if we can live in a field of color in the larger landscape and not be so kind of sequestered, right? So 
Um, here's how we did this. First of all, we opened up one entire side of the house and literally saw the entire garden right, as part of the house. So the end of the house is really the fence on the far left. And you know, this happened, of course, because we did like a giant sort of sliding folding door you know, that could take away like an entire um, uh, wall of the house, big steel beam above that, as you can imagine. Here's that image again, right, in sort of inception. And then we thought of like other landscapes, right, and how landscapes are sort of bands of color often, especially when they're productive landscapes, and how we might introduce some of that, right, in this landscape and then bring the color in. So you see sort of like the, the color that you see in the house, there's a bit of blue on the right. Um, you see that then sort of shifted out to the fence. Here's a bit more of the fence. There's also a water feature, so the blue again as water. And then um, that sort of um, banding of color is something that also is elsewhere in the house where the kitchen is, where light comes in from the roof is sort of more where yellow is kind of the color of light, if you will, and a little bit of orange and red um, that comes throughout. And that is it. Thank you all for your attention. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Um, I was here a little bit uh, late, but I was um, actually I was not confused, but I was um, you were talking about the, you know, obviously the communal um, differences um, between the US and Europe and um, and so this is where I got confused. So you were saying that the single family was uh, pushed by the government here in the US to kind of break up, you know, the communities, but then in the communist bloc, it was the opposite. It was the opposite, right? Yes, precisely. And so, so my question to you is, how are you guys approaching this communal living in the U.S. and and would it is it possible that you know how is that going to work? Is it going to change the way people are living, or I don't know? <laughs> That's so, interesting. Yeah. Thank you for that question. And you're absolutely right. Right in the U.S., um, housing was used basically to get people out of the cities, um, responsibility just around the nuclear family, and so on, as a way of uh, breaking up workers' unrest. In uh, Russia, it was the opposite. Right, they wanted people tied to the manufacturer. It's workers' housing, right? And there it was more like uh, breaking up the nuclear family in order to then have allegiance to the company and the party and so on. Today, right, we see something different, right? We see a kind of um, bottom-up natural breaking up or delaying of a nuclear family, right? There's, I don't know where exactly that comes from, right? I, I would say I'm not triggering it, you know, I don't know if architects totally have that power, <laughs> but I can see it, right? I can see it in San Francisco. I see it in the statistics for the US, which are similar in fact to the ones in, in uh, California to say like, um, it's a minority that lives of a nuclear family. So this must mean something and we can track it to some uh, overall demographic trends. People marry later, right? More women are in the workforce. You know, people don't necessarily have families so early or not everybody. So there are some trends, right, that are economic, that are in the job market, um, you know, lots of reasons um, that have triggered kind of this delay. And then the choice is sort of like, do you live alone, right, in that time? That's very unaffordable and you might miss community. I think the pandemic might have reminded many of us that you know, it can be very isolating, right, to not have community, it certainly was uh, in, in my vicinity, etc. So um, th there is a trend, right, already. And the trend, I would say, is not recognized yet, right? When I look at San Francisco, again, I, I refer back to it because that's just where I work. Um, but when you look there and it's what housing gets built, the majority is still like your one bedroom unit or your micro unit. It doesn't acknowledge, right, that people actually want to live in other scenarios. Um, I can also say from my own experience, both in Germany and here, um, people who are a bit older than me start talking about communal living. They're thinking, like, I don't want to be in an institution when I'm old. Not everyone has kids, right? So they're all thinking, like, what about, like, moving in in a building with, like, 
five or 10 of my friends, right? So the, the sort of notion of collective care is coming up with that age group. It's not just young people. And then, you know, some adventurous ideas about uh, co-parenting are re-emerging again. And people with kids think about like, well, I want to go back to work. I don't want to pay for daycare or I cannot pay for daycare. So what about sort of living with other people who have kids, right? And taking turns. So I think I, I would actually blame it very much on some economic force, you know, that's kind of had a lot of people reconsider and the absence of really good models when it comes to institutional care. So then to come back to your question, like what do we do as architects, right? Like what can we do? And with our research specifically, we're just sort of saying like, here are all these paradigms, right? Here are all these things that are working, right? That people are doing. Look at them, right? We're trying to get it out in front of people who make decisions, who make policy, who have money to develop, and to sort of say, like, shouldn't you do this, right? This has an audience. And um, I think that kind of quasi activist work can also be the work of architects, is, is sort of, I think, my point with it. We, we can't totally change the world from scratch, right? We're really just all in our bubbles and we all need to make a living. But I still think we have quite a bit of power, right? Whether it's through research or it's through designing conversations or, you know, really just starting small and designing small interventions. So like location-wise, have you only been thinking about San Francisco? Cause like I have like other brothers that are, they work in like different um, departments of like computer science and engineering and they go to Fort Worth or like, or, like Utah and all the people that are working at the firms or locations, they're all like renting one U, like renting one year Airbnb and they're all like doing it the same way you're talking about. So I was thinking like, have you thought of different locations? Have you like mentioned it to different locations and like where? Yes. Um, so. We have looked at other locations. Um, we've looked at uh, some East Coast locations. We've looked at uh, various cities across Asia and across Europe. Um, that's sort of like where our limit has been, um, mostly because we uh, don't have the resources to do sort of endless amounts. Um, I would say the trends that we observe is that the communal living does happen in sort of cities that are expensive and high density and have a lot of like young people. But once you move out of those cities, you end up seeing more of the kind of co-housing, you know, which is more like individual houses that have some shared facilities. So that I would say is really um, kind of much more widespread, right? And you see it in uh, much less dense um, kind of scenarios and, and locations. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question or understanding it correctly. Yes. <laughs> okay. I would love to expand the geographies more. Um, I also will acknowledge that um, a lot has been written about collective living in recent years. You know, there's a lot more books out, out, etc. And my own sort of focus has been because I live in California, right, and we started there. Um, to actually really consciously focus on the history of California and how in a way today's trend is rooted in some of those earlier uh, kind of periods of California, like the idealism, the, the immigration for the gold rush, et cetera. And like, how can we trace um, some of the same um, hopes and dreams and, and patterns, et cetera, back to what is happening today? Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Huh? Okay. All right. Well, Antia, thank you so much. Thank you all.